South Dakota's educational effort to raise awareness about the importance of soil health continues. The USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and I Grow South Dakota State University Extension for delivering these seminars with the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. and where we started and how we arrived at the point we are today and some things we're doing to advance our operation a little further. Uh, first thing I want to say is I'm in no way here to tell you how you should or shouldn't run your operation. Only you can determine that. I'm simply here to share our story and our journey in focusing on a healthy resource. A little, little bit about the history of our operation. We're located right actually in city jurisdiction for the city of Bismarck. Our ranch is about 5,000 acres. Of that, there's 2,000 acres of true perennial native range that's never been tilled. There's another 1,000 acres that is what we call tame grass pastures. In other words, it was tilled at one time and then seeded back to perennial forages. And then we have another 2,000 acres that is in cropland. This ranch was founded by my in-laws back in 1956, and they farmed it from 1956 until 1991, when my wife and I purchased a part of it from them. Now, when they farmed it, they were, the cropland was under heavy tillage. Uh, they tilled half summer fallow, half crop every year. And they used a lot of synthetics, you know, uh, fertilizer, pesticides, fungicides, etc. They primarily grew all small grains, spring wheat, oats, and barley. And I was fortunate when I bought that operation in 1991, we had NRCS come out and do some baseline soils work. And what we found is that the cropland acres, we could only infiltrate a half of an inch of rainfall per hour. Now we're in about a 15 inch rain moisture environment. Of that, about 10 inches is from rain and the other five inches is from the approximately 70 inches of snow we get every year. Also on the cropland, our, our soil test that year showed we were averaging 1.7 to 1.9 percent organic matter. Now soil scientists will tell you that historically in that area, central North Dakota, organic matter levels were in the 7 to 8 percent range. So in other words, from previous production practices, we had burned up, so to speak, three quarters of the carbon in that soil, and we had degraded the soils to that organic matter levels. Now, as far as the grazing system, it was three pastures as all season-long grazing. They could run about 65 cow-calf pairs, 35 yearlings. Pairs were then put out on crop aftermath, and then they were put in corrals and fed forages for six to seven months. Calving took place in, in uh, late February, March, a little bit into April. That was what it was historically like. And I've actually been on that place since 1983. We ran the cattle there for a number of years before we bought it. And every year I started to see more and more things like this. You know, because of the heavy tillage, we were seeing a lot more erosion. And I tended to see what I came to know now as, as a lot more symptoms. You know, we were having to put more and more inputs in to get the same amount of production out. And so what we went on was a journey over a period of years as to how do we improve soil health? And how do we do that? For me, the answer I found was in that 2,000 acres of native range. You look at native rangeland and see what it has and then compare it to the production standards we were getting. Well, nature's way of doing things, and Ray used this slide, there's no mechanical disturbance. Obviously, you had disturbance uh, from a major event such as a flood or something, but there is no mechanical disturbance. You always have armor on the soil surface in true native range, in a healthy ecosystem, that is. A true healthy ecosystem also cycles water, and it cycles nutrients. And it has thousands and thousands of years of research and development to it. You know, I kind of find it amusing that today we look at the current production map and we call it the conventional. Model. I would challenge anyone that this is the conventional model. 
because it's, it's proved itself over eons of time. So I came to the conclusion years ago that, that the greatest problem in solving a problem is the human mind. I had to change the way I looked at my branch ecosystem if I was really going to improve things. So, Ray touched on this, five keys to regenerating soil health. Ray upped it to seven, he's always trying to up me one, but, but I'll show you now, I'm going to go through and show you how our ranch focuses on these five keys, these five principles, and then how we apply them. Okay, if you look at native rangeland, obviously there's no mechanical disturbance. So, why is that? Well, it's in order to store carbon, build organic matter, and cycle nutrients. You know, there was nobody going and applying synthetic inputs into this native range, yet it continually produces year after year. Why don't we see that in our cropping system then? Ray showed these pictures about what happens with tillage and how we burn off, so to speak, or degrade the carbon, but we also destroy the porosity in the soils. And Ray demonstrated this with the, with the slate test. Where we don't have a disturbed soil that's been tilled, we have these soil aggregates. Once the soil's been tilled, we destroy those aggregates and that affects, it affects uh, uh, infiltration rates, it affects erosion, it affects a home for the biology because the biology lives in those pore spaces between those soil aggregates. Here's a photo that illustrates this really well. Ray and I spoke four years ago down in Kansas and this young producer, Michael Thompson, afterwards he, he really latched on to what we were saying and he went home and told his father, Dad, I'd like to try this. And to his father's credit, his father told him, okay, Michael, here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna, we're gonna take this quarter land, you're gonna farm part of it your way, with crop diversity, no-till cover crops, and I'm gonna to continue to farm the way I've been, with tillage, with monocultures. This fall, Michael sent Ray and I this photo. Look at that difference in three years' time by reducing tillage, adding diversity, and cover crops. That's pretty amazing. Which one's gonna have, have the most carbon? Which one's gonna store the most water? Which one's gonna to hold together through those rainfall events? That's pretty dramatic. Now they switched their entire farm over. He sold his father on the idea. So on our operation in 1993, I had a good friend in the northern part of North Dakota who was a no-till. And he said, Gabe, you need to go no-till in order to save moisture and save time. But if you do that, he said, sell all your tillage equipment, because then you'll never be tempted to go back. And I actually did that. We sold the tillage equipment and bought this no-till drill, and we've been 100% zero-till on our cropland ever since. And when I say zero-till, I mean zero-till. We want the least amount of mechanical disturbance possible because we don't want to destroy those soil aggregates. Here is what I think is one of the most underappreciated things we have going for us in production agriculture if we use it, and that's mycorrhizal fungi. And Ray talked about this. The importance of mycorrhizal fungi is it secretes that glue called vomalin that starts the formation of soil particles. So what you actually see here in this photo, this is off of a millet root, and this is the formation of soil particles due to vomalin. So we need mycorrhizal fungi if we want to build healthy soils. That's a photo Paul took on our operation last spring. Uh, that's just that thin, uh, trench that the disc opened when we were, when we were seeding. But I wanted to show this picture to show Ray mentioned this morning. You want your soil to look like black cottage cheese. I wish when I started uh, our operation in the early 90s I would have archived some of my soil because it would have been the dull brown soil, lifeless, compacted, with no aggregation that you saw in that earlier photo. This is what we've been able to build it to today black cottage cheese with a lot of soil aggregates. Those pore spaces are essential not only for biology, but also for water infiltration. I've been on that place since 1983. This road here separates my home place from the neighbors, and I can talk about him, he's not here. But every year since 1983, 
He's gone out in the fall and dug that low spot there every year. Not, hasn't failed for 31 years. June 15, 2009, they were forecasting a major rainfall event for us, which usually means about a quarter of an inch. But started raining at 6.30 in the evening. By 12 midnight, we had had 13.2 inches of rain. And I knew that because I, I took this photo and I was running out, dumping out the rain gauge. Three weeks later, that's what his low spot looked like. Now, the ironic thing is, in the 31 years, to my knowledge, he's only harvested a crop on that low spot twice. Because every time year we get a rainstorm, and this is what happens. He destroyed, by all that tillage every year, he destroys those soil aggregates. There's no way for that water to infiltrate. Ray showed it over. He showed that water cannot infiltrate when you till your soil. So why are we out there tilling? Now, Jay Fear, who's our district conservationist with NRCS, came out the next day. We had had another four tenths during the night. So we ended up with 13.6 inches in 22 hours. This field here is directly across the road from that field of the neighbors. Now, I'm a little embarrassed. We lost some residue. There's a few bare spots, but that doesn't look too bad for 13.6 inches of rain on it. Jay dug down in the soil. Whoops. No, I took it back. He dug down in the soil, and it's actually this photo right there. That's what the soil looked like after 13.6 inches of rainfall. Notice the pore spaces. We're able to infiltrate it. Now, I'm not going to kid you. We didn't infiltrate all 13.6 inches. Some ran over the surface. But it looks pretty good for that amount of, of rain being on. Here's what we've done on our operation. I mentioned we could only infiltrate a half of an inch per hour. The last time NRCS tested our soil was in 2011. We can infiltrate over eight inches per hour. I've never seen it rain eight inches per hour. It's not how much rainfall you get, it's how much can you infiltrate into your soil profile and then store there via organic matter for those plants to be able to use later in the season or when they need it. That's why to me, you know, for years, 10 years, I tilled alongside the father-in-law working summer fall. And it just didn't make sense to me. What were we really trying to do? He thought he was saving moisture. No, he wasn't. He was costing himself moisture. And that's been proven time and time again, and I'll talk more about that coming up. Okay, the other thing mycorrhizal fungi do, this fungal hyphae network will go out over a much larger area, and it forms these symbiotic relationships with the roots. So if you don't have mycorrhizal fungi in your soil, you're only going to be able to transfer water and nutrients from a much smaller area of the soil profile. Dr. Christine Jones, who's one of the world's foremost authorities on mycorrhizal fungi, was on our ranch in September. And she made the comment to me that in Australia, where she's from, she found one mycorrhizal fungi that covered over 2,500 acres. Think about that. You know how many nutrients are being transferred over 2,500 acres? So instead, as producers today, we worry about, you know, accurate fertilizer placement and all this technology. Hell, all you got to do is get mycorrhizal fungi and it'll transfer those nutrients for you. I don't need to spend all my money on that type of technology when nature will do it for me, and she'll do it for free if I provide the proper environment for it. The other thing, what else do mycorrhizal fungi do? Mycorrhizal fungi occupies the roots of the host plant. When those roots are occupied by mycorrhizal fungi, they're no longer able to be invaded by pathogens, nematodes, etc. So you'll have much less disease pressure when you have a healthy mycorrhizal fungi now. This is all, has all evolved from eons of time with nature. Why aren't we taking advantage of it in production agriculture today? So, mycorrhizal fungi improves aggregate stability, it builds soil carbon, improves water use efficiency, and it improves the efficiency of nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and other micronutrients. We need to take advantage of that. What can we do to increase mycorrhizal fungi? Reduce tillage, reduce synthetic fertilizer, reduce synthetic chemicals, and we have to have a living root in the ground as long as possible. And I'll talk more about that, because we have to have the host species for those mycorrhizal fungi. 
Second principle, armor on the soil surface. Native, a true healthy native ecosystem has armor on the surface at all times. Remember I told you back when we started farming with my in-laws, there was an armor on the soil surface, then we ended up with degradation such as this. You know, why do our streams look brown all the time in the spring from runoff? Because we don't have that armor on the soil surface to protect it. Bare soil is detrimental to soil health. So one of the things we focused hard on now in our operation is to have that armor or that residue on the soil surface. Notice we're planting corn there, no trash whippers. That's way too much tillage. Why do we want to leave that soil bare, prone to wind erosion, water erosion, and a place for weeds to germinate? We don't want that. The crop will come up just fine through that, that heavy residue. The other thing it'll do, it'll buffer that, that heat we get later in the year. We'll keep our soil temperatures much cooler. And Ray talked about that. These particular uh, photos here were taken at our place on a day that was just under 100 degrees air temperature. In the cover crop, we were 87 degrees. Bare soil was 107 degrees. Well, you might think that 20 degrees, what difference does it make? But look how it affects the plant. At 70 degrees, 100% of that moisture, soil moisture is used for growth. When we get up to 100 degrees, very little is used for growth. That plant starts start to shut down, that moisture is being evaporated. And when we get much higher than that, and there's many times I've been on operations where we read soil temps 130 to 150 degrees, then we're killing off biology in the soil. That's directly impacting our net profit, our bottom line. We have to keep armor on the soil surface, keep those soil temps cool. This photo was taken that same day. Look at right under the surface, we got earthworms working because we're able to keep that soil temperature down where it doesn't inhibit this. It doesn't affect that soil biology. You brush aside the cover crop and what do you see? That's solid earthworm cast. Ray mentioned about earthworms. I tell the story, when I started on that operation, we could never go fishing because there was no earthworms to be found. Last spring, we did earthworm counts, 12 inches by 12 inches, two inches deep. We were averaging over 60. That's a lot of earthworms. That is the most nutrient dense plant food you'll find. What about those pore spaces that those earthworms those tunnels they dig, those roots are gonna follow those earthworm uh, uh, pores right down. It's gonna improve infiltration also. These are free, I don't have to pay them with the exception of providing the home for them. Why don't we do that in production agriculture today? Third thing, diversity. I'll tell you a little photo about this particular pasture. I bought this tract of native ground in 2002 and I tell people, I bought it for two reasons. One, it was true native prayer. Paul teaches rangeland management at the local college there. He brought his students out to this uh, pasture one day, and in two hours, they counted over 140 different species of grasses, forbs, and legumes. That's a healthy native rangeland ecosystem. Why don't we have that in production ag today? The other reason I bought that land was because with that many rocks, I'd never be tempted to break it up. Now, I thought I had some rocks, but when I was traveling in Australia, came across this field. The amazing thing was, Ken Miller was with me, we stopped and looked at it, and we were taking pictures, and here the farmer pulled up. This is seeded, there's old seed in it. But don't feel sorry for him, look in the upper right, he picked the worst ones. There's a rock pile. The thing about it, we got to visiting with the farmer, you know, we just played, played dumb tourists, we didn't tell him we were farmers ourselves, but. He sent me a photo then, emailed me a photo of that oats crop when he was combining it in the fall. How would you like to run your equipment across that? I tell people I can build a lot of topsoil on our operation, but it's going to take me a few years to cover that many rocks, you know. But it can be done. So the third principle of soil health is diversity. You look across the United States today, what do you see? You see corn, you see beans, you see wheat, monoculture, monoculture, monoculture. Why are we farming that way? Where in nature do you find monocultures? Pretty much only where man put it, right? Otherwise, there's diversity. 
We're trying to fight nature instead of working with her. Ray showed this photo. Look at that. 17 years of monoculture and tillage. That's what you're doing to your soil. That's why we have to change our mind and get away from this type of production model. It just doesn't make sense. In 2006, I had the good fortune of going to a No-Till on the Plains conference, and this gentleman was there. That's Dr. Adamir Caligari from Brazil, the world's foremost authority on cover crops. Works for the United Nations. He's worked in over 65 countries all over the world. And up until this time, I'd been growing cover crops in one or two or three maybe species mixed together. But Dr. Caligari said two things that day that really stuck in my mind. He said, you give me two inches of rainfall a year, 200 inches, anywhere in between, and I'll grow you a cover crop. Well, then I knew no matter what environment I'm in around the world, we can grow covers. The other thing he said is this, cover crops are meant to be seeded in multi-species combinations. And I, I, I'll never forget when he said that because I was really mad at myself. Because I'm going, duh, look at native range. What's happening in that native rangeland ecosystem? You have all these different species growing together. So Dr. Caligari talked about how when he works with producers, he's recommending seven, eight, nine, ten with different species in a mix. So we decided that uh, we're going to try that on some of our soil conservation district land in Burley County. So the winter of 2005-2006, there wasn't a lot of snowfall. It was really dry. And we have some plot land that's located a mile south of my ranch. And we decided what we were going to do, we were going to go in there and we were going to seed monocultures, an acre of this species, acre of, acre of uh, radishes, acre of turnips, acre of sorghum sedan. And then at the end, we were going to mix all those species together and test his theory as to what had happened. Now, we seeded these in May, and it was really dry, as I said. And from the time we seeded them in May until these photos were taken July 31st, we only had an inch of rainfall. Okay? That's what the turnip monoculture looked like on July 31st. Right next to it was the oil seed radish. No different, dried up. And you keep going down the line until you got to the polyculture mix. How do you explain that? For years we've been told in production agriculture you've got to grow these monocultures, you can't allow any weeds, you can't grow plants together. Really? Nature's telling us otherwise. Why are we trying to impose our will on nature? Now, NRCS clipped those plots that day, and look, we tripled above ground biomass where the polycultures were. Now, the difference here at the end, half rate, full weight, we simply got too many plants per square foot. But look at that. I mean, this, more than anything else, taught me the lesson that we need diversity into our system. Dr. Chris Nichols, who's a soil microbiologist, explained it this way. Not only do the fungi, and she's talking about that mycorrhizal fungi that I talked about, provide for the needs of one plant, but the fungal hyphae pipeline connect to multiple plants, thus supplying the energy and nutritional needs of multiple species. So that fungal hyphae pipeline connects to all these different roots. The deeper rooted plants help feed the shallow rooted, vice versa, and they bring up different nutrients. That's how nature evolved over time. That's how our native ecosystems evolved over time. We need to take advantage of that in our production systems today. It really came to, to really teach us that monocultures are a detriment to soil health. If we want to really focus on, on healthy soils, we got to get away from the monocultures because it's diversity that's going to drive soil health. So, we all know there's four different crop types. Cool and warm season, broadleaves and grasses. I mentioned that my father-in-law planted spring wheat, oats, barley, all cool season grasses. And there's a lot more crop types than this. And then there's warm season. There's four crop types, but a lot more species than this. Why are we focused on, on growing so few crop types? So what we've evolved to now in our operation is that we try each year to plant some of all four crop types. Now don't pay any attention to what species I plant. They may or may not work in your operation. Just notice that I'm planting some of each of the four crop types. 
I'm trying to get that diversity onto my fields, so we're feeding that biology a diverse mix. And now, since that time, we've evolved even further where we no longer try to plant monocultures. For instance, in the upper left, that's oats with clover growing in it. The upper right, that's a mixture of cool season broadleaves. The lower left, that's, uh, that's corn with hairy vetch and clover grown in it. And in the lower right, that's sunflower. And there's actually about 20 different species of covers growing in with that sunflower. So we're trying to cover this, have the multi-species, get away from the monocultures. Okay, fourth principle. Living root in the ground as long as possible. And Ray talked about that. You look at a native prairie ecosystem, we have cool season, warm season, grasses, forbs, legumes, very, very diverse. And from the time that snow leaves in the spring up until well past when the snow starts in the, in the uh, fall, we have a living root in the ground as long as possible so that mycorrhizal fungi can form these relationships. Ray showed this picture. Approximately two-thirds of your organic matter increase will come from roots. So the more roots we can put in the ground, the more organic matter, or in other words, carbon, that we're going to build and store in our system. This one just, uh, I, I, I just can't figure this out. You know, above every acre, there's approximately 34,000 tons of atmospheric nitrogen. Why as a producer do we want to go write the check for synthetic nitrogen, urea, anhydrous, etc.? It's free. It's, it's, in the, it's in the air. All we got to do is plant legumes in our rotation and we'll have it. We're not taking advantage of it. So in our system, this is a picture of a field of oats where we went in and we underseeded three types of annual clover in with. So the clover is fixing nitrogen through mycorrhizal fungi. It's transferring some of that end to the roots of the corn plant, I mean the, the oat plant, then we straight combine that oats off, and we have this growth of clovers if we get some rain. It's a little dependent on moisture. But then we can either just let that clover go, we can graze it, but it's that living root extending the growing season. Here's a picture close up of the corn with the hairy vetch in it. That's worked really well in our operation to do that. And I tell you what, you're going to graze cattle on those corn stalks afterwards. That vetch is tremendous protein. You'll balance the protein needs of any class of livestock with vetch in that, in that ration. Now, we've tried to do some broadcasting where we go in at about V6 and we broadcast. In this case, it was subterranean clover and turnips. We usually don't broadcast. We really are too dependent on the rainfall to get that started, so I prefer to drill it. But the years it has worked, it works pretty well. And there's a picture of that in the fall then. Here we are, we're ready to combine that corn and we have that beautiful understory of covers in it. So, the other way we can have a living run in the ground as long as possible is with these cover crops. And in my mind, a cover crop is a diverse mix of plants that enhance the life and the function of the soil. That's what we're really trying to do is address our resource concerns. Now, on our operation, we grow a myriad of different cover crops. This is just some of them. This past year, we actually grew over 70 different species of covers on those 2,000 acres of cropland. On our 2,000 acres of cropland, we try hard to have a cover crop growing on every acre every year, either before a cash crop, along with the cash crop, or in the case of fall biannuals, after the cash crop. You're kidding yourself if you think you're going to really advance soil health by putting a cover crop in following a wheat harvest, for example. We just don't have a long enough growing season in our environment. We've got to change that, and Ray explained that when he was answering the questions. So the first thing you need to do when you're planting a cover crop, you have to decide what's your resource concern. What am I trying to do? You know, am I trying to improve nutrient cycling? Am I trying to increase organic matter? Am I trying to build soil aggregates? Am I trying to enhance pollinators? What am I trying to do? I see way too often where producers go seed a cover crop without answering this question first. That cover crop they, may, they seed may or may not address their resource concern. They actually may compound their resource concern problems. 
you have to ask yourself this question first. The other thing a cover crop can do is it can fill in the production gap. You know, where in my crop rotation, where do I have an opportunity of time to grow a cover? Or in the case of livestock production, where do I need to fill in a forage gap for my livestock? And I'll talk more about that. Now, why diverse cover crop mixes? If soil health is truly your goal, crop diversity cannot be overstated or ignored. Plants were created to grow in very diverse ecosystems. We know this, it's proven. Resiliency, and Ray talked about resiliency, fragile, anti-fragile, it comes from diversity. You're gonna build soil health quicker with diversity. You need to feed that soil biology a balanced diet. Those microorganisms, they eat different things. They all eat carbon, but it's gonna depend on each species as far as what type of root exudate it, it secretes. Biology need diversity. And then you gotta have balance, because even good things, when used in the wrong proportion, can be harmful. And I've seen this. I've seen way too many circumstances where people plant cover crops high in brassicas or legumes, and then they wonder why they have no residue left on the surface. Well, they planted way too low a carbon crops, they cycle the nutrients through faster, the residue disappears, and they end up with erosion problems. You have to figure out what's your resource concern and then keep it in balance. If you want to design a mix, and I'm not promoting any cover crop seed uh, dealer over another, but this is a really good place to go learn, greencoverseeds.com. Keith developed what's called a smart mix calculator. You go on their, their website, you click on smart mix calculator, then a form like this comes up, and it has all these, these different categories here, and it's got drop boxes, so you can click in there. Okay, I want to put, for instance, five pounds of sorghum sedan, and it'll automatically calculate how many seeds per pound, et cetera, et cetera. Cost. It's free to use. It's a really good uh, way to get you thinking about diverse mixes. So, say we decide, well, our resource concern is that we, we don't have enough mycorrhizal fungi because we've tilled this field with too long. What do I seed to help improve the mycorrhizal fungi in that particular field? Well, this lists some of the grasses and broadleaves that you can use to address that resource concern. And there's many others. I just listed a few of them. What about if you have poor infiltration, compaction? For instance, if I ever buy my neighbor's land there, I'm sure I'll see things like this. This is really common. Because of the tillage that's used, you have a compaction layer down. The only way we're going to break that up is through living roots, as Ray talked about. So we'll go in there. Here's another common site. That's a daikon radish. And Notice it's about 14 inches above the soil surface. I'll guarantee if you go down under the soil, here, you're going to find a compaction layer down. As these radishes start going down, they hit a compaction layer, they're pushed above ground, until they finally get enough energy to poke their way through. So you can alleviate compaction layers with species such as this. You need that diversity below ground, just like we have it above ground. There's different root types, fibrous roots, tap roots, shallow roots, deep roots. We need to think of that. We need to think of addressing all the areas of our soil profile. Now, some of these roots can get really large. That's a 16-inch tire there. If you're really uh, concerned about compaction and infiltration, use radishes instead of turnips. And then you cannot plant them in the spring or they'll just tend to shoot a seed head, bolt and go to seed. Plant them from late June on, and then you tend to uh, get the larger type tubers. Now my friend who Ray showed you a picture of, David Brandt, he brags about his big radishes. So I said, that's nothing, David. I grow big turnips. <laughs> so it's a contest between us. But what happens, these are, not only do they poke a hole in the ground, these radishes, but then they release their nitrogen accumulators, and they release that nitrogen very early in the spring. Here's a photo early in the spring. That's all you see then, is those infiltration forms. You know, Ray mentioned it. What about subsoiling? And you know, these people want to go in with that, with that steel and break those compaction layers. 
The trouble is, they're just going to move that compaction layer a little deeper because it'll just be whatever depth they were subsoiling at, that's where the compaction layer is going to move to. With roots, we can alleviate that. It'll take us a little longer, but we can permanently alleviate it by using roots such as this. And there's a lot of species. You know, sorghum sedan, ryegrass, radish, turnip, sweet clover, sunflower is really good. Any of those with deep tap roots will help you alleviate those compaction and infiltration problems. Now, what if your symptom is like this, low organic matter soils? Like, the soil on the right there is what I started out with soil like that back in the early 90s. We can go in there with species that produce a lot of root mass because that root mass will add organic matter to the soil, as I said. So then we go in with these type of species that produce that large amount of root mass. Now, the question was brought up after Ray's presentation about what about using moisture? Aren't cover crops going to use all our moisture? Well, here's a study that was done on Marlin and Patrick Richter's farm. They're about farm about 15 miles south of me in Burley County. And what they did, they went in following a winter triticale crop. And they uh, harvested off the winter triticale, and then they planted a very diverse cover crop mix. And they decided what they're going to do, they're going to test this. They had, a, they had a field that was actually split by a, a tree windbreak. And they said, okay, we harvested the winter triticale, we're going to plant cover crops on one side of the shelf belt, no covers on the other. This is the mix that they used. Notice in here that there's no cool season grasses, because the winter triticale was a cool season grass. They're trying to get diversity, so they're using the other crop types there. Then what we actually did, we weighed the calves before we turned them on to that cover crop mix early October. We weighed them going on, weighed them coming off, averaged 3.1 pounds a day gain on the calves. We did not weigh the cows. This is pretty common to get three plus pounds a gain, gain grazing these warm season mixes. Because those warm season mixes high in C4 plants, in other words, like the sorghum sedan, in other words, they have an extra carbon molecule, they're usually higher in energy, you'll get better gains. So, weighed them coming off, averaged 3.1 pounds a day, so you take off the cost of the seeding and the cover crop seed, Richter's netted themselves an extra $66 an acre profit. At that time, uh, they sold the calves immediately after, and the price of the calves is in there, but uh, an extra $66 an acre net. But what's the value of that increased recovery time for their native rangeland? Because they got the cattle off of native range, and then what's the value of improved soil then? Now, we wanted to know, here is the next spring. Marlon had just planted corn. This is the, you see a number right, the trees. This is on the one side of the field, that's on the other side. Where there was the cover crop, look at that residue, because they were careful not to remove all the residue with grazing. They left over half, but look at that residue protecting that soil. Look where they didn't have the residue. Now, NRCS came out prior to planting in the spring. They took soil samples to figure out how much water did that cover crop use. You know, how much was used, because that was the big concern, is how much moisture was going to be used and affect the following crop. There's the answer. There was four one hundredths of an inch difference. And Ray said this, our soils can only hold so much, because we only have so much organic matter in our soils. Why not use it to produce a cover crop, graze it with the livestock, turn it to cash that way, build organic matter in our soils, then down the road we'll be able to hold more. So this proved to Richter's that it wasn't costing them any moisture. It was wasted opportunity is what it was. I can't figure out for the life of me why any producer out there with livestock would not grow cover crops. It just doesn't make sense not to. Because there's no way you're going to improve soil health, and why not take advantage of that and convert that building of soil health into dollars. There's the weed pressure then too the next spring. Which one side needed an extra herbicide pass? So you're saving money that way also. And we can use species that are known weed suppressants if we want. And here I listed some of them. So you can use these cover crops to your advantage to address your resource concerns and they'll end up putting more dollars in your pocket. So, 
On our operation, one of the easiest places for us to start using covers is with fall seeded biannuals. This particular photo is of winter triticale and hairy vetch. On our operation, that's a slam dunk no-brainer. I've never had the hairy vetch winter kill. I've only had the winter triticale winter kill twice in the past 21 years. So we just use combinations like this all the time. And it leaves us an awful lot of options. And that's one of the beauties of this type of a system is you will have more options. Paul and I really like to cab out on winter triticale and vetch. It really works well for us. And we cab from May 15th through the end of June. We turn the bulls out for 35 days, about a 45 day calving window. We move the cattle, uh, we don't set up a back fence, move the front fence every two to three days. We're not moving them uh, real often every day and we don't confine them real tight while they're calving. We found that this leads to extremely healthy calves. We, it's just, we just don't treat calves anymore. It just doesn't, it's a fresh, clean calving ground. Now, before I show you the next slide, I'll tell you a little story. Paul, just being out of college when these photos were taken, he had a lot of his friends back here uh, five and six years ago, we had a couple winters that were really pretty harsh. They were, you know, 120 plus inches of snow, and his friends were emailing and calling them that they were fighting scours and mud and slop, cabin in corrals during the winter. So Paul says, I feel sorry for you, but you can feel sorry for me when I cab. And so he sent them this photo, you know. Cabbing in sync with nature is an absolute dream. That's the way it was intended to take place. When you do it that way, it's really a joy. That's one of the ways we can use these fall seeded biennials. Now another way we can do that, we can obviously graze it as it's growing with stock or cattle or whatever, but in this particular situation, this particular field, our resource concern was that we didn't have enough armor on the soil surface. So we purposely let this winter triticale vetch get to a higher carbon state. In other words, a more mature state. And then we grazed high stock density, used high stock density grazing on it. In this particular photo, we were grazing up just under 700,000 pounds of live weight per acre. And we went in there and did multiple moves per day. We used bat latches and we were moving these about five to six times a day but we were doing it for a specific reason, and that reason was to put large amounts of carbon down on the soil surface. The cattle were only eating a third, but they were trampling the rest, which is what we wanted. We could easily make back all of our costs, plus some profit, by just grazing that top third, and then we were addressing our resource concern. So here's what it looked like then when they were done. You got dung and urine, as Ray said, spread out over the whole thing, you got that litter trampled onto the soil surface, and because we had waited until it was nearly mature, it killed this. So in place of the crop roller that Ray showed you, that's the way we terminated it. We didn't have to go in there with the herbicide pass. Then we're able to seed directly into that a couple days later. And we'll seed a very diverse cover crop mix. That's what the, the mix looked like, about 20 different species. I always get asked, how do you set the drill? Just set it so the largest seed can flow through. It's really not an issue. Works well, we seed it a half to three quarters of an inch deep. Smaller, the larger seed breaks away for the smaller seed. Here's the type of diverse mix we were seeding. Because we're seeding that in the middle of summer, we're gonna use primarily warm seasons. Your sorghum, sedan, millet, sunflower, cow peas, etc. Those are primarily warm seasons. We do throw in a few cooler season species just in case we get a cool summer like this past one. There's a picture of the larger seeds breaking away the way for the smaller seeds. Notice the soil aggregates in that picture. That's what we want to see, soil aggregates like that. Then we have a lot of different options for this cover crop. Here's what it looks like with any luck with a couple inches of rain. Now, the winter triticale and hairy vetch will use most of the available soil moisture. But when you have a healthy, efficient soil, we can get that type of production in less than two inches of rainfall pretty consistently because we've built that resiliency into our soils. And with the armor we have on there, we're not going to evaporate that moisture off. So it's going to be used by the plant. Now, there's many things we can do with the warm season cover, though. 
In this particular case, we were grass finishing some steers on there. Now, when we grass finish livestock on there, we don't run near as high as stock density because we want them to be able to select for maximum energy intake that'll equate to higher gains. Or we can run cow-calf pairs on there. As I said earlier, pretty easy to get three plus pounds a day gain grazing these type of mixes. And if we want to flush a herd of cows before breeding, that works extremely well also. They'll put on a lot of weight. So we'll let them eat of roughly a third of the above ground biomass, trample the rest, and then let them on to a new grain. Okay, so that's another option. You see what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to build all these different options and scenarios so we have resiliency in our system. We don't have to worry about drought, etc. We can then, if we don't graze it that way, we can just let it go, let it run its life cycle. And here's how we convert most of our cover crops on our operation into dollars. It's by running our cow-calf pairs on those covers through winter. North Dakota State University did some good work with the nutrient content of these forages in winter, late November, early December. Now I tell people, if you're gonna run cattle on there, your covers, use turnips. Use a forage type turnip, because it's not really the root, the tuber thereafter, it's the forage. But radishes, in this case, in late November, still 14% crude protein, 70% TDN. There's a turnip, it'll be roughly the same. Cattle like to eat turnips better than radishes. Hairy vetch, as I mentioned, hairy vetch, even in winter, will still be near 18% protein. 70% TDN. Pure hairy vetch, while it's growing, will be 25 to 30% crude protein. It'll be higher in protein than alfalfa. This is a slam dunk no-brainer for us. Why not balance? Why do I want to go write a check? You know, we have a motto on our operation. We want to sign the back of the check, not the front. Works pretty good. Why do I want to write a check when I can plant a cover and let that be our protein supplement rather than purchasing a protein? Millet, we usually don't use a lot of millet in our winter or mixes that we're going to graze in the winter because millet tends to fall off rather dramatically in protein and TDM as compared to like brown midrib sorghum sedan, which will hold its nutrient content really well into winter. Allow your livestock to do what they do best. It absolutely amazes me. On the way down here yesterday, we saw a number of people and of course they were all in North Dakota, not in South Dakota, but that were feeding already. And I'm like, man, we got, we're open, why would you be feeding? Don't provide your cattle with the bed and breakfast. They have four legs, make them use them. And we do. That's not a herd of muskox. That's 47 degrees below wind chill. That's 350 cow-calf pairs grazing cubs. I actually felt a little sorry for Paul as I sat in the pickup and he walked out and took that photo. They'll do just fine if you have the right type of livestock and acclimate them to these conditions. Now when we graze our covers during the winter, we're gonna do just like we do when we graze our pastures during the summer. We wanna make sure and leave that armor, that litter on the soil surface. One of the biggest complaints I see from the grain farmers is, oh, but livestock, they leave the ground too bare and compaction, etc. That's a function of time. Don't let your livestock eat it all. You gotta leave that armor on the surface. So, Ray talked earlier about soil tests and, and about the, quote, standard soil test and the Haney test. I'm gonna show you through a series of slides what we found out, okay? So we start with this. Here's a field that had a cover crop on it. We took a standard soil test, showed, and I know this is too small to read, Top two feet of the soil profile, we had 10 units of nitrogen. How much corn can you grow on 10 pounds of egg? If I went to the agronomist and asked him, and I told him, you know, county average in Burley County, North Dakota is just under 100, they're going to say, well, you better add close to 100 units of N on here if you want 100 bushel of corn. Well, we haven't used any synthetic fertilizer since 2008. Here's what we did. We went in there. Noah uh, planted our corn in there, and I typically plant corn from May 15th to May 20th, somewhere in there. When I say I'm a no-tiller, I'm a no-tiller. On the left is planted, on the right is not. 
We don't want to disturb that residue any more than we have to. Now look, we're starting with a lot of residue. Then here's June 16th. There's July 1st. Where's all my residue going? Dr. Ray Ward, who owns Ward Labs, Ray talked about him, Ward Labs, Kearney, Nebraska. Him and I are friends, but for years we had a little bit of an argument. Dr. Ward said that my system is going to eventually crash because I'm going to use all my nutrients. I didn't believe that because how did nature work? Nature cycles nutrients through if you have the diversity to allow her to do so. So Dr. Ward came up, took a sample, a leaf tissue analysis of this corn crop here at Tassel. This is the same field that showed I only had 10 units of nitrogen. I didn't add any. Here's his leaf tissue analysis at Tassel. Notice nitrogen's the top line. I'm actually in the high category. Every nutrient he tested for was sufficient to high. Where did it come from? Now, I want to say this right away. I'm in no way, like Ray, I'm in no way telling you stop using your fertilizer. You will have a wreck if you do that, if you're using synthetics now. Because what happens, as you grow these covers, you're tying up a lot of your nutrients in the above ground biomass of those covers, the roots, and in the soil biology. Soil biology is just like us, made up of nutrients. So you have, think of it as your little fertilizer storage bag, okay? If you quit all of a sudden cold turkey adding synthetics, you're gonna have a wreck in your cash crop next year because you're getting all these nutrients tied up in that biomass and in biology. You have to wean yourself slowly. So here's what that particular field looked like at harvest. I am embarrassed to this photo because it shows bare soil on my operation. I never want people to see that. Since this was taken, that's why I've gone to uh, seeding the covers in with the cash crops now because I don't want it to show that soil to be bare. It's prone to erosion. It's going to infiltrate water at a much slower rate. Soil temperatures are going to be higher. I'm not feeding biology. I'm going against every principle of nature in that form. So here's what we yielded in 2012 on our whole place. We averaged 142 bushels of corn 2012. Here's my actual income and expenses from 2012. Now, since this time, we have now dropped out of federal crop insurance. I don't want to be on welfare, so I no longer take any uh, federal subsidies for that. So we've dropped out of that. But what I want to show you is my cost to produce a bushel of corn. Corn locally this fall was down to $1.73 a bushel. I could still make money on that. There's not a lot of people who can, but we could still do that. To be honest with you, I didn't plant any corn here in 2014. I just saw that cycle coming and there was a lot of other crops that I could plant that uh, I knew I'd make more profit on than corn. But if we focus on the resource and on soil health, we can significantly lower our costs of production. The soil's alive. That's what it's about. I mentioned that I had no earthworms when I started. This is what we got now. A super earthworm, some of them. Ray said it this way, soil without biology is geology, and that's what it is. That's why that soil test did not work, because it only showed the chemical and physical properties when it was showing me 10 units of nitrogen. It did not take into account the amount of nitrogen and other nutrients I was going to get from the cycling caused by soil biology. So, Dr. Rick Haney, and here's Dr. Rick Haney's address, phone number, and I don't mind giving it out. What do I care if he gets a lot of calls? That's a good thing, because then we're, we're going to move this forward. He developed the system, as Ray said, that uses natural means, water and red exudates, to figure out water extractable organic carbon, which is the food, it measures that, which is the food that that biology eats. So I really look at this test to be the link between the current production model and how we move to a more biological model, which is what it's about. I've been using that test now, what, Ray, five years, right? On our operation, I tell you, he can pretty accurately predict the kind of yields you're going to get. Now, the question about livestock and the importance of livestock. 
These two different colored bar graphs here are two fields of mine that are side by side. They both have been no-till for many years. They both have had very diverse cash crops, very diverse cover crops over the same period of time. The difference is the lime barred field has had two years where we grow the full season covers and use high stock density grazing on Now, the first bar over here is total nitrogen pounds, 86 to 90. No significant difference. Inorganic phosphorus, 65 pounds to 239. Next bar is potassium, also inorganic, 429 to 595. What this proved to many of us is that livestock are an important missing link as to making these nutrients more available. So what we're doing is we're able, there's something about the very diverse mixes, livestock raising them, cause those mixes to release root exudates, also propagate the biology that break down those organic forms convert them to plant usable forms. Livestock are an important key in building a healthy soil. We have 400 acres of cropland on our operation that we cannot graze. There's housing developments around it. The soil health there will never be as good as it is where we're able to graze livestock. I still grow crubbers on those acres, very diverse cash crop mixes. We're still not using any synthetics, but we're not near to the soil health point as where we are, where we're able to graze livestock. Banana Shiva said it best. In nature's economy, the currency is not money, it is life. You know, it's come to the production agriculture now is to the point where the soil is just a medium to hold the plant up from. That's all it is, and we're trying to spoon feed it every nutrient we can and we're writing a check every time we do it. If we grow living things and turn our soils into more biological system, we no longer need those type of inputs. So here's what we've been able to do on our operation. In 1993, 1.7 to 1.9% organic matter. Today we're from 5.3 to 6.1. The 5.3 is on those soils where we're not able to graze livestock. But we're moving, you know, we've over tripled our organic matter in our soils. What does that equate to nutrients? This is pretty simple math. You just figure out in a slice of soil, the NP sulfur carbon multiplied times whatever the rate is at your local elevator. In other words, for every 1% organic matter in the soil, we have about $750 worth of nutrients. If we increase our organic matter to 5%, what does that mean? It's my nutrient bank account. There back when I still had a banker, I was using this on my, as prepaid fertilizer expense. Why not? Now he laughed, of course, and didn't take it into account, but I was trying to drive the point home with him. What's the difference? Other producers are writing a check prepaying their fertilizer. My fertilizer's in my soil. Same thing, right? Soil carbon is the key driver for the nutritional status of plants and therefore the mineral density in animals and people. Soil carbon is the key driver for farm profit, and Ray said this. I sincerely believe this. Also, water holding capacity, which I'll discuss here. We have to start thinking in terms of carbon. Ray said it when he asked the question, What's, what nutrient do you most look at in your soil? Many people think nitrogen. It's carbon. Carbon drives all of the profitability on our farm and ranch. Now, what about water holding capacity? What role does it play? When I started out, less than 2% organic matter, I have silt loam soils. So in other words, the top four feet of the soil profile, I can only hold about eight inches of water. Now we're over 5% organic matter, I can hold well over 20 inches of moisture in my soil. We're in a 15 inch rainfall environment. Every drop that comes, as long as I have the soil covered, the aggregates, the pore spaces infiltrated, I'm gonna be able to keep it and store it for when I need it. We build our own droughts, Ray said it. We do. When we have resiliency built into our systems, no longer affects us. Now, 1% organic matter in the top six inches of soil can hold 27,000 gallons of water. So do the math. When I started out, I could hold about 256 million gallons of water on my operation. Today, we've upped that to 810 million gallons of water. What difference? How much? 
more biomass can I grow off that? That's how come I can grow the cover crops I can on very little moisture. It's because our soils are efficient and they store water. Fifth principle, animal impact. Ray talked about this. I own this newspaper, The Prairie Farmer, 1871. That's on the front cover of that newspaper. That's how our prairie soils were formed. Large herds of grazing animals being pushed across by the predators, and then you also had local species such as rabbits, grasshoppers, etc. It was a living ecosystem is what it was. Where are the animals in production agriculture today? You know, driving down here, I did see a few cows out grazing some cropland, but they're really not integrated into the system. We have to start doing that. Now, I mentioned when we took over that operation, we could run about 100 head of beef animals total. Today, we run 350 cow-calf pairs. That's our constant. We try and keep our cow herd the same every year. We run between four and 800 stockers and grass-finished animals, depending on forage conditions. We've got a small flock of sheep, and I'm not gonna have time to get into them, but we do run sheep. This year we added pastured pork, started that up. We run a significant number of broilers. In these broiler mobiles Paul makes, we pull them across the paddocks, work extremely well. Most profitable enterprise on the operation right there. We also run a lot of land hens. And these land hens are also the fly control mechanism for the grass finished animals. We pull those portable leg mobiles around here where we run the grass finished animals, those layers spread out the manure pads and eat the fly larvae, works extremely well. We haven't used any porons or insecticides on our operation on the livestock in eight years. No need to do it anymore because we're working with nature. I don't have time in the presentation to get into all that, but the dung beetles, the predator insects, for, for every insect species that's a pest, there's 1,700 that are beneficial. Okay, why do we as producers focus on killing that pest when we're killing the 1,700 that it kill that pest? Makes absolutely no sense. No sense at all, and it just costs us dollars out of our farm. Now what does this mean when we go to this type of a production model? That's what it means. You don't think there's a difference between a pastured egg and a factory raised egg? Tell that to our customers who are paying $4 a dozen for, for eggs. We used to think on our operation of this or this as being our customers. Now we've changed our mindset. We're trying to direct market everything we can off of our operation. That's Paul's uh, meat concession trailer there. We're marketing things. We're trying to equate healthy soils into nutrient-dense foods. We want to be price makers instead of price takers. This is one of the big problems in production agriculture today. We're price takers instead of price makers. We should be setting our own price. So here's what this equates to in our operation. Paul put this chart together. Soil, water, sunlight, carbon, that's what we start with. Here's all our enterprises up top. We have cash crops, cover crops, perennials. We have, starting over on the right, we've got a small orchard, I didn't even talk about that. We market wildlife on our operation. We have a cow calf operation, grass finished beef. We have a sheep operation. We have guard dogs and border collies. You might as well sell pups out of them. We have bees, which we sell retail honey. We have poultry, both broilers and layers. We market the screenings of our grain crop through the broilers, add value. We also sell screenings to other people who need livestock feed. We have pork, sell retail pork. We have grain, we sell all natural grain. We also run grain through the pork. We got a vegetable business. Here's just some of the ways we convert to do those things into dollars. I tell people, if you think there's no opportunities for young people today, that's bull. And here's just some of the other operations we're thinking of taking on. And I've only listed some of them. Biggest problem is we're just three people on our operation. You're only limited by your imagination. That's all you're limited by. There is so much money to be made in production agriculture today, it's not funny. And it does not include going to the mailbox and getting a check either. 
It includes doing it on your own, whoops, with all these type of enterprises. And all we're doing on these is we're taking advantage of what Ray said, biomimicry. We're mimicking nature because we need the guard dogs to take care of the sheep. Well, if you're gonna do that, you might as well sell breeding stock. You might as well sell pups. You know, we've got the grain. Well, you got screenings from the grain. You might as well market that through, through poultry and then market it to other people also. First question we get asked when people come to buy product from us is, where are you from? They wanna know where I'm from, so if they have a problem, they can come directly to me, and that's fine, I'm good with that. Second question they ask every time is, are you GMOs or non-GMO? That's the second question. We're 100% non-GMO, we use it to our advantage. That's what, I'm not gonna get in an argument whether GMOs are good or bad, but if that's what my customers are telling me, then I'm gonna sell them. Third question is, do you use antibiotics? No, we don't, haven't for years. Now, I'm not gonna say that we don't treat an animal, but if we do, if we have to, then that animal's sold through conventional means. It's not sold as meat. And the fourth question is, do you use any artificial hormones? No, we don't, so we're able to capitalize that. Take advantage of it. And the reason we don't no longer need those inputs is because we have a healthy system that relies on biology instead of on inputs. That's what it's about in our operation, is building a healthy soil. If we start with a healthy soil, we're gonna have clean water, clean air, healthy plants, healthy animals, healthy people. And make no mistake about it, we have a health crisis in this country. America spends more on health care than any other country in the world, yet we're the 42nd healthiest country in the world. Now a lot of that's due to our sedentary lifestyle, but make no mistake about it, part of it's due to our food production model also. So here when we started in 1993, we had low organic matter, very shallow soil. We started to diversify the cash crops. That was the first step in the ladder. Noticed an increase in organic matter. We added cover crops, another step up, building healthy soil. Then we really went to the multi-species cover, another step up in soil health. Built the topsoil even deeper. Then in 2010, when we really started to integrate the livestock and the different species of livestock, we noticed a large jump in the organic matter in our soil. And now here this past year, we actually have a plot of land that tested 11.1% organic matter. And our goal is to take that field scale now. We're gonna see. And I'll tell you, we did all this without any off-farm inputs with the exception of seed and other hay we brought onto the operation. Because we prefer to buy most of our hay rather than put it up ourselves, just for the reasons that Ray talked about. Other than that, we're doing this just with what we have on our operation. Then we're able to build very healthy topsoils. 1997, I had the opportunity to attend a holistic management conference, and Don Campbell was one of the instructors, and he made this statement to me, and I'll never forget it. If you want to make small changes, change how you do things. If you want to make major changes, change the way you see things. And I'll never forget that statement because I had to change the way I was looking at my soils and my farm ecosystem in order that I could move on and take it to the next level. There's our contact information. You can feel free to contact me or Paul at any time. We gladly take questions and emails. So Ray's got a question. Dave, you think our farms are too big? The, the question is, do I think our farms and ranches are too big? Now realize that's going to depend. I don't want to name acres because it's going to depend where you're on and what you're trying to do. But on our operation, we were over 6,000 acres of owned and rented land. We shrunk to 5,000. We're going to let some more acreage go as leases come up. Because we're stacking so many enterprises right now. Paul and I sat down last winter, and I'll be honest, there was a few drinks involved, but we were trying to figure out how few acres do we need to support a family in our environment in North Dakota. There's zero doubt in our minds we can do it on 160 acres. No doubt at all. We can easily do it on that. You know, I've got a neighbor who farms 40,000 cropland acres. What's the point? I will guarantee you I'm producing more calories of nutrients per acre than he is by far. Because he only has one enterprise. He's growing one cash crop off those acres. I've got all these different enterprises on my operation. And I'd like to believe that's one of the things we're working on is document 
nutrient density of products. So I think farms are too big, but realize if it's according to where you are in your operations. Good question, right? Other questions? Yes? Is there a key population I target for cover crops per acre? Realize, of course, it's going to make a little bit of difference according to the species, does the species stool, etc. Good rule of thumb is where you're at, what's the uh, average seeding rate for wheat as far as plants per acre? In my area, it's about a million to a million two hundred thousand wheat seeds per acre. That's a good starting point for cover crops. Mixed. You know, use that as your guideline because it's going to vary where you're at. You know, obviously, further west, drier environment, you're going to go to the little lower populations. Yeah. I know I'm, yes, another question. How do you, how do you seed that vegetable you plant the corn? How do I seed the vegetable when I plant the corn? I'll be very honest. I used to, back in the years where I used glyphosate, we haven't used glyphosate in quite a while now, but I used to seed that triticale vegetable together in the fall. Spring of the year, I'd use a little... Uh, hit it lightly with glyphosate, it would kill the triticale, the vetch would just get sick and it would regrow. Then I quit using glyphosate. You can still do that same thing with a grass herbicide like shadow, or what I've been doing is I go in the day before and I actually seed the, the vetch and clovers, then the next day plant the corn. But now I bought a white planter, like Ray showed the pictures of David Brandt with that white planter with 15 inch inner rows, where now I hope to be able to plant my corn on 30s, my cover crops on 30s in between. Because I just don't want those two passes that's burning fossil fuels and, and I don't like sitting in a tractor. So that's what I'm going to do, is try going to that model. Hairy vetch is a biannual. You know, that's how it evolved over time to be seeded in the fall. But if you seed it in the spring, it'll tend to act like an annual and run its life cycle that year. But you could go with annual clovers too. Crimson, Versine, Merrill Leaf, something like that, subterranean, they all work also. With that, it's lunchtime. I'll be around so we can ask questions during lunch and after. We oh, we got time? Okay, if we got time, I went through that pretty fast. Other questions? Roger, what? Oh, yeah, stand up here, Roger, and I'll, I'll hand you this and you can talk about that for a minute. And then we'll answer some more questions. Dave and Ray have just uh, made a strong case for the integration of livestock and uh, cropping systems. Um, I'm, I'm Roger Gates. I'm a range extension specialist for SDSU. You can help us out by helping us learn where folks in this part of the world are on, in terms of uh, cropping systems, livestock systems. If you would help us by answering a two-page survey front and back, all you've got to do is check your answers the surveys are in that far table. There's a stack of surveys. Um, it's anonymous if you'd like to. Um, we're also interested in identifying people that are um, uh, intrigued about doing some cooperative on farm research. So if you're interested in that, there's also a place to leave your contact information. So if you'd help us out by spending three minutes to do that, we'd greatly appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, yes, please please do that. I think it's absolutely fantastic that we're getting research agencies interested in this type of a production model. Now, I want to make one other thing clear before I go. Uh, 2,000 acres of crop, okay? Up till two years ago, we were seeding about 90% of those acres, so in other words, about 1,800 to cash crops every year, and then either a cover crop before, along with, or after, and then the other 200 acres was full season covers. Now what we've gone to here is we've started seeding back a major component of our cropland to perennial grasses and forbs, perennial. Because I really think if we're gonna heal the ecosystem, we have to get perennials in there. So I can't tell you at this time how long we're gonna leave those in, we'll see. But what we wanna start doing is going to the production model where it's in perennials for a number of years and then moved into annuals. Because I really think that'll heal soils much, much quicker than an annual type system. 
And I often get asked this, you know, how do I heal like a corn bean rotation with covers? You don't. You're not going to get there. You're going to make small, minute changes better than nothing. But you've got to diversify the rotation. That's one of the big stumbling blocks is people just are not willing to diversify their crop rotation. And they have a million different excuses. And who was it? Henry Ford who said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. You know, I have not, I feel 100% confident there's not an operation on the world where I can't get this system to work. Because we're seeing it work in every country all over the world where there's production agriculture. It will work. It's just a matter of you making up your mind that you'll get it to work. What you say, Ray? Any other questions before we break for lunch? Yes. Are there times with the triticale vetch where it's real muddy and then I wouldn't want to put livestock on there? Is that your question? We just don't put livestock on there if it's really... But to be honest though, Paul, how many times has that happened? Can you remember? No, I can't remember it happening either. The cattle got to be somewhere during that time, the livestock, whatever species you're using. So what if they muck something up a little bit? We just slow down the next year when we see it. You know, the beauty of systems like this is taking advantage of nature. One of the things we found, uh, we showed the pictures of calving on winter triticale vetch. If you calve on there, then move them off before it starts to shoot a seed head, move them off, it'll go to seed and will reseed itself for the next year. And we get two years worth easy out of one seeding. Or if you graze stockers on there, you can move them on and off there up to six, eight times, let it grow, bring it back on, let it grow, bring it back on, take them off. You know, you can take advantage of this. In a dry year, why not do that? You know, take advantage of nature and use these things to your advantage instead of fighting against them. Other question? Ray, did you have something to add? Because you're itching, inching your way up front. You're making me nervous. I thought you were a stalker. No. Any other questions? Okay, with that, I guess it's lunchtime. It is lunchtime.